So welcome back everyone from the coffee break. Uh, we are going to start the second panel, uh, which is titled 30 years of the V4. We are going to talk about the past more than 30 years before uh, we are moved to the next panel, which will be about the future. So with the war in our neighborhood, it is more important than ever to remind ourselves to the more than 30 years of cooperation within the framework of the V4. It is a really challenging task uh, to talk about all of the achievements and challenges of the past 30 years uh, within 75 minutes, but we try to. Uh, please allow me to introduce the speakers. Um, Alana Kutsko, she's a director of the Globsec Policy Institute from Slovakia. Um, and then we have uh, Tomasz Grzegorz Grosse, who is a political scientist at Warsaw Institute, a uh, European University Institute as well from Poland. And we have uh, Mr. Joman Roch, a publicist, political expert, and he also uh, has been the executive uh, director and vice president of the Civic uh, Institute in Prague. And unfortunately, our Hungarian expert uh, couldn't make it today, so only uh, Four of us are going to talk about um, the past of the V4. So in the next 45 minutes, uh, we are going to have a discussion. And then in the remaining 30 minutes, um, we were going to have a Q&A session. So please prepare your questions in advance. Uh, we are very much looking forward to answering your uh, questions. So um, my first question will be, uh, about uh, the role of the V4. So what was the V4 30 years ago when it was established and what is it today? How do you see the development, uh, the involvement of this regional cooperation? Uh, do you see a change in its roles, in its goals uh, compared to the establishment? Uh, maybe we can start with Elena. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicolette, uh, for having us here. But I also wanted to thank first the organizers for bringing us to Budapest today. And uh, I genuinely admire this setting. I've never been to this room before. It looks gorgeous. And I think it's also reflecting on the conversation today. It's a lot about the past, but in fact, it's a lot about the future as well. So answering specifically your question. Of course, the uh, V4 has evolved over time, but this is only natural when we're talking about any international institution or a grouping of countries or cooperation between the countries. V4 was, and it still is, is both the product of the external environments, but it also has huge capacities to shape the external environments. If we're talking about the time when V4 was conceived, when it started working together, definitely the situation was very different than it is right now. And that defined what the V4 is for and what the V4 can do and should be doing. What was remarkable uh, about the V4 is that uh, in no ways that should be taken for granted that V4 should have existed. It was not an easy task, and the countries, the, at least the leadership of the countries, did a good job in bringing the countries together, in figuring it out that uh, we're better off we cooperate with each other rather, if, uh, rather than if we squabble and argue with each other, which often happens between the neighbors. Uh, of course, at that time, it was clear that uh, Europe is not, in a way, only the only choice, but Europe is also the destination of choice for all the countries. So all the countries knew what they want to do, and that, in a way, made the task of V4 easier. There was a common mission, everybody wanted in which direction we want to go, and there was an agreement that we're better off if we go in this direction together. So from that perspective, at that time, this clarity of mission made the V4 kind of determined the success of V4 uh, in the future. But also, there were other considerations that played a role there. For example, I mentioned already that uh, countries decided that we do not want to squabble with each other, and a lot of uh, concerns uh, um, surrounding that were coming from uh, the uh, post-Yugoslavia region, where a lot of countries back then here saw that, look, what might happen to us if we start worrying with the, if we start fighting with the neighbors? So there was also this effort to work together and create some partnership agreements with the neighborhood rather than um, 
risk having some kind of conflict in the region. So all these determine the shared direction of the V4. And uh, probably the main difference with where V4 is right now is that there is no agreement even between the members what V4 is for. There are different visions in which direction the V4 should go. Some countries pull in more into uh, bigger political projects. Other countries prefer more technocratic cooperation and focus on the practical issues. So this is probably one of the main fundamental differences that changes how the V4 operates and how V4 thinks about itself now from back in the days. Thank you. Uh, Roman? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Well, I'm grateful for the invitation to, to attend this conference and listen to your uh, observations and to share some of my few remarks. As have been already mentioned by gentlemen at the first panel and by Alena as well, there were several reasons for V4 in the past, those more than 30 years ago. First reason was obvious. It's always good to have friendly relations among neighboring countries. Uh, we shared the communist past before 1989. Uh, we were oppressed together by then Soviet Union, which fortunately collapsed in 1991. And uh, we were keen on uh, introduce democratic form of government in our respective countries. Uh, in the past, relations between or among Central European countries were not so friendly. Uh, we might observe that for the last 30, 32, maybe 33 quite soon years, we have lived, we Central Europeans have lived inside a miracle. Inside a miracle in the sense that we have been free, we have had liberty, Secondly, we have been safe and secure, uh, good relations with all neighboring countries, uh, no enemies at our borders. And thirdly, we have been quite prosperous. In the last 30, 32 years, we have been quite prosperous. In the past, there were times of lesser or greater freedom, of lesser or greater prosperity, lesser or greater security. But to have a combination of freedom, prosperity, and security, that has been quite unique. So first purpose of Visegrad was to have friend relations among us. The second purpose, perhaps even more important, to cooperate with each other in order to get, as soon as possible, inside both the European Union and NATO. The decision, a prudent decision by our statesmen was that we should not try to, to enter alone before other countries are admitted to both the EU and NATO, but let us have a common front, so to speak, and try to enter the EU and NATO together. Uh, firstly, we entered NATO, three countries of V4, in March 1999. Uh, then at the Prague summit of NATO in 2002, there was a decision made that there should be a major NATO enlargement and uh, not only Slovakia, but many other countries like Baltic states, Slovenia, uh, Romania, Bulgaria should be admitted. And that happened in 2004. And eventually the EU. The, the, the first major EU uh, enlargement was in 2004 as well on May the 1st, if I am not mistaken. And several countries, 10 countries in Central Eastern and Southern Europe were admitted. Countries in Southern Europe like Malta and Cyprus. So by 2004, concerning both EU enlargement and NATO enlargement, uh, we were able to observe that Visegrad cooperation was very successful. Was that the end of the Visegrad cooperation no, if we look at the development after 2004, there was one or several differences of opinion between not only Visegrad four countries, but many post-communist new EU members in Central Eastern Europe. Differences from the major opinion in old EU countries in Western half of the Europe. And that difference of opinion concerned 
primarily the great uh, immigration wave in 2015 and 2016. Uh, the prevailing opinion in Visegrad four countries was that uh, some of those people were war refugees, but most of them were migrants. Migrants who just decided to settle inside Europe without the consent of European citizens. And even though the Lisbon Treaty allowed and still allows in a, in a case of necessity something like a redistribution of migrants or refugees, it was quite imprudent to coerce our population to accept uh, migrants uh, which uh, our peoples were not convinced that would be a bright idea, and even more importantly, those migrants did not want to settle in other part of Europe. Their primary destinations were both Germany and Sweden. Uh, so there was something like a common political position of all uh, Visegrad, four, Visegrad four countries concerning that great migration wave from the, from the North Africa and the Middle East. Um, people in these countries were convinced that we were not the first safe countries. The first safe countries were Turkey, Jordan, uh, culturally much closer to, to migrants than we were. Secondly, they saw uh, young men migrating to Europe. Uh, and those two um, features of that migration wave are very different from the current situation with the Ukraine. What is remarkable is that both governments and populations in V4 who were so reluctant to accept migrants seven years ago, six years ago, have no problems with accepting refugees from Ukraine, from refugees trying to escape Russian aggression against Ukraine. Why? Our peoples are convinced that those are, these are real refugees from war, primarily women with children. That's first very significant difference. Not young men, but women with children, primarily. Secondly, uh, we are the first safe countries. Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Czech Republic, because it is a Slavic country, are natural countries to accept refugees and provide them with help, with security. And people understand that. And there are no anti-refugee sentiments very similar to those seven years ago. And uh, thirdly, concerning Slavic countries like Poland, uh, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, we, have, we are very close uh, in languages. So it's quite easy to help Ukrainian uh, refugees, Ukrainian women, because it's not so difficult to understand each other. And for them, if they settle, at least for time being, in our countries, they can learn Slavic, language, Slavic languages, Polish, Slovak, Czech, quite easily. So that was second major difference between you know, Western Euro <coughs> European approach towards immigration in 2015 and Central European approach to immigration. We can mention perhaps other uh, aspects of both public policy and national sentiments which make us, Central Europe, V4 countries, a little bit different than there are many uh, Western European countries, like cultural and moral aspects. Uh, Poland, and firstly, and Hungary, secondly, are perhaps the most conservative societies in Central Europe. Uh, Slovakia is in between, and Czech society is perhaps the most secular and the most liberal. But even in the Czech society, the majority of our elected MPs, members of parliament, uh, representatives and senators, uh, have never agreed to pass uh, a bill to accept a law on same-sex marriage. We have so-called registered partnerships or civil unions uh, for couples of the same sex. No problem with that. But still in a very secular and liberal Czech society, there has so far, maybe in the future it could change, no one knows, but so far there was never a majority in either house of our bicameral parliament in favor for legislatively 
defining marriage as a union between same-sex couples. And if, if you look at the map, it's very different in, in many Western European countries, even in Germany. And in Germany, they have passed uh, the same-sex marriage law several years ago. Uh, in this Central uh, and Eastern Europe, not only V4, uh, can be more conservative or is perhaps more conservative on cultural and moral issues than is the Western European mainstream. So I believe that uh, these special aspects of V4 countries um, will stay with us in the future, and I don't expect that V4 will be, uh, will be left by any of those four countries. V4 cooperation in one way or the other uh, will, uh, will stay with us. Uh, th there are differences in societies, of course, Poland and Hungary are more agricultural. The agricultural segment of Czech economy is not so significant. We are a less agricultural country than industrial and touristic country. So, uh, for example, on the common European agriculture policy, uh, we are not so keen on, on higher subsidies to, to farmers than our French citizens or Polish and Hungarian citizens. Uh, we know about a special relationship between Poland and Hungary, especially concerning the intra-European Union issues, uh, disagreements about what's the proper understanding of the rule of law, of uh, democratic rule of law. Uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia are more neutral on that issue. And of course, now I, I will stop at that, but the greatest challenge in coming years for V4 cooperation, of course, are different approaches to the Russian aggression against Ukraine for Czech, well, once again, for Polish first, Czech second, and Slovaks too, uh, the security or the military help to Ukraine against Russian aggression is being perceived as a vital security interest. Not just security interest, but a vital security interest. So, it's our security interest in Europe that Ukraine is preserved as an independent nation state and no pro-Russian puppet government is installed in Kyiv. Hungary so far has been neutral on the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, of course, Hungary, like other European countries, has condemned Russian aggression and is helping Ukrainian refugees. But concerning military, transfers of military, of weapons, of armaments, uh, military technologies to Ukraine, uh, Hungarian position is, is different than is, for example, Polish, Czech, and Slovak. But that will be a challenge. However, the war in Ukraine will end one day, this way or the other. No one knows so far. And uh, cooperation in the V4 countries, the reason for it, I, I expect to, to, to remain and to continue. Thank you, Roman. Uh, you mentioned a lot of important issues. Uh, we are going to circle back to most of them. But first, uh, I give the floor to Tomáš to answer the original question, uh, which was that what is the role of the V4 today and what was its role 30 years ago? Do you see any changes uh, in the role? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for invitation for this important conference. And uh, my colleagues, Alena and Roman, said so many important issues of uh, answering, of fielding your questions. So it is, I would like to agree with majority of statements and add maybe uh, only a few um, uh, remarks in addition. Uh, first of all, the uh, Visegrad Group cooperation, uh, regional uh, cooperation of neighbor, neighborhood countries uh, was a loose regional cooperation in Central Europe, uh, focusing on economic uh, as well as political issues. So it was uh, not uh, 
uh, highly ambitious uh, cooperation, we would say, uh, targeting to establish, for instance, some kind of uh, federation in Central Europe, uh, rather uh, some, some um, uh, regional grouping which uh, aimed to uh, improve relations, uh, starting with uh, common uh, interest, uh, common history. Uh, mm, all of uh, those countries uh, uh, became from communist uh, regimes uh, to uh, democracies and, and free market economy. So, uh, uh, the, the reason why that uh, cooperation was not uh, uh, highly in, uh, institutionalized uh, um, or targeting some kind of deeper political community like uh, federation or something like that uh, was that uh, from the beginning the basic uh, aim of uh, all the Visegrad uh, countries was to uh, apply to European and transatlantic institutions uh, to the EU uh, European communities and uh, NATO so it is uh, it was a common target, uh, but also uh, the, the consequences uh, of that uh, application, we would say, uh, was uh, uh, lower ambitions uh, related to institu uh, institutionalization, because, uh, of course, the EU, for instance, uh, excludes any. Um, uh, deeper uh, institutional framework of uh, of uh, of um, regional cooperation inside this uh, um, uh, community but still uh, it is possible to advantage to to to, to go further into uh, making v uh, four cooperation more stronger and ambitious because uh, if we compare another regional frameworks uh, inside uh, the EU, like uh, Franco-German, for instance, uh, based on treaties, re revised treaties, uh, and with uh, uh, quite intense governmental uh, uh, cooperation, etc., it is a good uh, example that even inside the EU, uh, we could uh, have such uh, intense uh, institutional or polit uh, political cooperation without any problem or uh, destabilization to uh, deepening, for instance, uh, European project, uh, uh, European integration. So it is uh, for us a clear example that we have some uh, open possibilities to, to go further uh, and uh, institutionalize uh, our cooperation further. Uh, and after accession to the EU, uh, I can see two clear uh, goals of uh, V4 uh, cooperation. The first one is related to the uh, EU uh, itself. I mean uh, collaboration on uh, various uh, European uh, public policies. We, uh, of course, uh, some of them are mm, uh, important for us. Uh, we could perceive uh, those uh, policies at the same way. We have uh, many common interests related to public policies, like migration policy, for instance. Of course, some, some uh, other uh, mm, uh, we perceive uh, them in a mm, different way. It is quite normal. But uh, because we have also some, some uh, possible uh, common position, uh, 
we should discuss and uh, elaborate the, uh, those positions together because uh, it is quite, uh, quite obvious that uh, smaller countries, particularly in comparison to Western Europe, Europe more experienced and uh, powerful in terms of uh, uh, influencing European institutions and, and European uh, uh, decision-making process. So, so in comparison to Western countries uh, and Western regional structures like Franco-German, it is quite obvious that uh, our starting point uh, in uh, those processes are, is weaker and we should uh, level up our position, starting position. So Visegrad group for sure uh, gives some platform, some opportunity to elaborate our common position and then uh, propose uh, uh, this position not as a, uh, a position of a particular a single country, but in fact from our whole region. And uh, that uh, voice should be heard uh, in Western capitals, uh, presumably. Um, more than a singular position of, 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 of Poland or Czech Republic, etc. And the second goal is related to cooperation of the Visegrad group with external partners, both in our region, broadly defined Central and Eastern Europe. And secondly, uh, to ex uh, more distant partners, partners uh, from Western Europe, from, uh, uh, from East, uh, etc. So, um, uh, but the logic is the same. Uh, if we could cooperate and uh, achieve the common position, given subject, the voice of four countries is stronger than a particular singular voice and it is advantage for us as a grouping and it is it is it it might be fruitful not only in the cooperation inside the EU but also in other directions of our external relations. Okay, uh, Alana mentioned something very interesting in, in her opening uh, statement. So she said that uh, 30 years ago it was clear for everyone what the V4 uh, stand for, what it was for. But she said that uh, today it's not so clear anymore, so there's no agreement uh, what the V4 is for actually. Um, do you agree with that? Do you see that the same way? Or, or would you say that you disagree, uh, Roman and, and Tomás? Well, 30 years ago, the main goal was integration to European and transatlantic structures, European Union and NATO. We have been 100% successful. So there could be an impression that there was something like a loss of mission because of victory. We achieved that mission successfully. Now, um, there have been certain developments beyond Europe. I'm now not speaking about Russian aggression against Ukraine. I'm speaking about that fact that the United Kingdom has left the European Union. That's, that has not been good for us, for Central Europeans. Uh, before Brexit, there were three major powers in the EU, Britain, France, and Germany. And powers of secondary influence, uh, Italy, Spain, and increasingly Poland. When Britain left the EU, now, there is something like a domination of French-German duopoly. In that duopoly, uh, Germany is stronger. 
Germany is stronger. In order to have a balance of interests in Europe, it's for us useful to try to coordinate our positions, I mean V4 countries, and to try to attract other coalitions of willing, sometimes with Baltic states, Sweden, Finland, sometimes with Slovenia, Croatia, Romania, but to play an active role in a European Union dominated by France and Germany is something which seems to me to be a common sense. Alone, no one country is strong enough to provide a counterbalance to, to French, German, German uh, duopoly, and the strongest is Poland, of course. But together, we could be a real force, real political force. So that's the first point. Second point, we have seen in the last American administration, I mean Trump administration, a temptation by former President Trump uh, to leave European security matters for Europeans. Uh, this incumbent president, Joe Biden, and his administration uh, have a several similar opinion concerning concerning China. So Trump and Biden administrations differed on many things, on many issues, perhaps on most. But concerning foreign, foreign and security policy, both Trump and Biden administration agree that the main challenge for America, the main geopolitical challenge for America uh, in coming decades is going to be China. Uh, that was before Russian aggression against Ukraine. Now many things have changed again change again, and now the unity of European countries and the unity of North America, meaning US and Canada, and Europe, is much stronger than before. But to be realistic, uh, Americans in coming administrations, regardless whether Democratic or Republican, will start to focus on, on China much more. And uh, European security, uh, will be something we will be becoming more and more responsible for. We in V4 are on the eastern flank of, of both the EU and, uh, and NATO, together with Baltic states, Finland, Sweden, Romania, Bulgaria. So we are front countries now. When, when Russia has invaded Ukraine, we are on the front. And that's why there is another reason. Uh, American focus on China is another reason for increasing our cooperation, both inside the EU and inside V4 plus, plus other countries, in order to provide for our common security. So uh, when Britain left the EU, when Americans are going to focus more on China, there is a natural reason for us to increase, not decrease our cooperation. And we cannot have now one single goal, yeah, like uh, EU admission or NATO admission. We have achieved that. But our goal is to, to have a European unity and uh, European security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russian neo-imperialistic revisionism. And that's the reason for cooperation. Tomáš, uh, would you like to chip in to this question? Uh, thank you very much for the question, and uh, I agree with Roman uh, once again. So I could uh, add only a few remarks. Uh, um, as I said previously, the uh, V4 is uh, an alt alternative for the EU uh, or, or NATO. It is rather uh, a, a way to develop common position uh, in Central Europe uh, to, to make our voice uh, in those institutions or, or, or organizations uh, stronger. Uh, the example of uh, cooperation with the uh, United Kingdom is uh, highly visible in my view, uh, even symbolic, because in fact uh, after uh, Brexit, uh, we still have co common interests uh, with uh, Great Britain um, in terms of security, uh, geop uh, geopolitics, 
but also in, uh, in terms of, of economy, uh, trade, etc., money, uh, others. Uh, so the, even uh, Britons uh, perceived uh, the EU and integration, integration of processes uh, to some extent uh, highly uh, similar or very uh, si similarly to us. So, uh, mm, uh, but uh, of course the m m more important relation is inside the EU between uh, Visegrad group and uh, Berlin and, and France because uh, the, uh, France and Germany are two the most in influential, powerful countries which uh, for decades uh, shaped the integration of processes. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have uh, in uh, many uh, subjects different perspective to Germans or, or French. And it, it would be better to a little bit to balance our relationship between Central and Western uh, Europe uh, to establish more cohesive and, and more common approach towards the uh, future of Europe. Uh, because uh, uh, it is, of course, uh, not a good idea to impose uh, some European or pro-European ideas by Western countries uh, on uh, Central European countries. Uh, so we can see tension about uh, uh, that systemic discussion, what, uh, which is related to the future of Europe. And the um, tension uh, resulting or from from uh, rule of law and uh, European values uh, quarrels is strongly related to uh, the asymmetrical relation uh, relation between uh, west and east of the EU and uh, many controversy uh, uh, which uh, uh, are um, uh, between us between the two sides of the EU so uh, the V4 cooperation is a way to um, uh, work out uh, our common position in Central Europe and propose to our Western partners that position and um, to, to make the EU integration more balanced. Uh, more balanced because, the, of course, I, I understand that from time to time, particularly during uh, the crisis, it is important leadership uh, of our Western um, friends. But on the odd other hand, uh, that leadership should um, respect our interests and uh, if we have different opinions, like during uh, migration crisis, they should respect us and they should uh, respect our uh, different uh, culture, political culture, sensitiveness, uh, and this kind of uh, thing. So for the future of Europe, it is highly important to, to, to uh, create more balanced integration because in fact it is not to uh, the German and French interests to uh, create uh, unbalanced uh, union, uh, which uh, only creates some uh, ideas uh, in the western part of the EU, uh, foisting uh, values, uh, law, and and. Uh, uh, ideas on Eastern partners. It is not a good way to develop um, our project and uh, it, it would be very wrong for the EU, uh, to the EU's uh, detriment, we would say, 
follow this path. So in fact, our uh, Visegrad group could uh, reform uh, the, uh, how the EU is constructed or the, the process of negotiation is constructed, uh, which could in fact save European project. Uh, alternative of uh, not uh, uh, respecting the uh, central European uh, country's position is the scenario like Brexit, yes? That Britons uh, didn't agree that uh, they uh, are not listened, they, they don't have enough impact on, the, uh, on, on uh, public policies in, in the EU, so they decided to leave the organization. And from my point of view, it's not appropriate scenario. And uh, for sure, uh, uh, any uh, Visegrad group country support this kind of scenario. And our co cooperation inside the EU is, uh, in my view, uh, some hope for uh, the EU and um, it could uh, rebalance the organization to our common interest. So um, you have already touched upon a few challenges that the V4 faced uh, in the last 30 years. So I, I turn now to Alena. Um, what do you think, what were the biggest challenges in the, in the 30 years in V4 cooperation? What can we learn from them and what should we do better? What, what should we do in another way to keep the cooperation alive even in those very uh, pressure times that we live in today? What's your opinion about that? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I already... Roman mentioned it uh, and we discussed it a little bit that indeed because V4 was so successful in achieving on its original mission it's in a way also a victim of its own success because it rarely happens that organization will be or formation or group of countries will come together for a particular mis mission that will be delivered with smashing success. So from that perspective it will never be the same and there will always be an impression that uh, uh, for people who have very high expectations, there will always be an impression that V4 under-delivers. So maybe one lesson learned is that don't have too ambitious expectations that you will always have big, clear mission and you will be, always be 100% successful in it. So probably uh, a challenge that I see now is that uh, uh, indeed um, we learned that a green is great. Uh, agreeing between the countries, especially between the neighbors, is absolutely necessary. It was said already several times that we are stronger together if we manage to agree on things, if we manage to find common interest. The challenge that I see developing over the past years is that we do not always find common interest. And, uh, um, for example, we discussed today the security as a common interest, but it seems like even on security now, it's visible that we do not always agree. And the current situation, Hungary was mentioned, yes, Hungary maybe sees it as defending its national interest, but other countries in before do not see it uh, uh, the way how Hungary frames its position on Russia. They do not see it to be in the interest of the entire V4 group. So here there is a fundamental disagreement. But also the question on the values or the rule of law was mentioned and um, I actually don't see it as an east-west divide and I do not see that uh, uh, all countries in the, is in the V4 see this rule of law issue as the absolutely most paramount mission of V4 cooperation. Like Slovakia or Czech Republic do not think that V4 exists to fight the West on the rule of law issues and the defense uh, some kind of central European position. We say it very differently, so there is a lot of divisions within the region itself about uh, what rule of law is and how democracy functions. So I also don't think that this is a united mission. And maybe one challenge that we are also facing now is that, again, uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic, they see the Hungarian or sometimes Polish Fed attempts to make this a common mission as a little bit of damage in the V4, simply because they do not want to be represented in such a way, even if sometimes they are very open to discuss the issues, they see some problems with how you operate, but they do not entirely align on this issue. And finally, when we agree on issues, we do not always agree on priorities. For example, um, for if you talk to the people 
people in the region. And what people would be concerned about is the practical issues like energy infrastructure. Or let's, for example, uh, there was a project that V4 is going to build high-speed trains. Fantastic, let's do it. These are the true priorities for people. And they would like V4 to deliver on that. And instead, unfortunately, they, what dominates the headlines is, let's say, the issue of the same-sex marriage. Maybe some people, most people will agree with this issue, but by no means they want it to be the headline and the priority of the cooperation. So maybe the challenge now is try to focus it more on the practical issues that deliver for people and where the people see practical outcomes of the V4 cooperation. And I totally also agree on the consequences, uh, rather negative consequences for V4 and the region from Brexit. I would also frame it in a little bit different angle. I see a lot of negative economic repercussions for the region from Brexit. Before, because Britain was also aligned with this kind of entrepreneurial spirit, free markets, and this is something that uh, will be a problem for the region, also because objectively, the world is simply changing. Our old economic models might not be so successful, so economic issues would return. So from that perspective, we do need to revitalize cooperation between the neighbors to make sure that, again, we can deliver yet another economic success. Yeah, allow me to ask a follow-up question. So even in the previous panel, the question of regional identity and V4 as a brand was mentioned. So uh, I, I think uh, when we are talking about challenges, maybe we should touch upon that question as well. So do you think that the V4 managed to construct a regional identity, a V4 identity in, in this region? Or is it rather a, a, pro a political project made by the elites which does not translate to the societies? How do you see that question? Identities are always very malleable, and they're never either a product of political construct by the elites or purely a product of the public. It's always an interaction. I, I agree with what Tomas was speaking about, that Central Europeans in general still feel that they're different from the Westerners for different reasons, different uh, um, factors. I don't think that if we think, if you ask people whether they feel more that they are Visegrad group members or Central Europeans, they would probably just say in general that we're from Central Europe, we're a bit different. But that does not mean that the Visegrad as a brand is not important. It absolutely is important. And again, as with every brand, uh, brands are also not fixed in time or recognition. Brands can change in terms of how popular they are, how fashionable they are, whether they're associated with a positive image or a little bit of a negative image. So this Visegrad brand, it also changes over time, depending what highlights the agenda. Definitely, there were a few very good successes. For example, economic transformation uh, attempt to be entrepreneurial is a very good component of the Visegrad brand, and it's probably for the next session, but I do think that's something that Visegrad can build for the future as well. This economic drive, uh, free market spirit, ability to deliver successful transformation. But unfortunately, brand is not always what we think about ourselves. It's also how the others see us. And unfortunately, in the past years before, received this negative image. Uh, it started already with the migration crisis. It's not even a matter who was right or wrong, but it's a matter that in the West, it was perceived a little bit negative, but it also receiving a little bit of a negative branding right now for the issues that, uh, where we often think that we are right, but we do not always effectively communicate that uh, why we are right and that we are right. And I'm talking here about the issue of the rule of law, which also is having some negative connotation for the outside communities. But again, I don't think this is something that will stay forever. Brands can be worked with. And of course, we either need to adjust the product that delivers on these brands or to adjust our communication and to make sure that we do uh, more effort to explain what we mean and why we mean it, but also um, part of the branding and part of the how we construct the kind of identity of the region is not just uh, how we often see is this, you know, this complaining Eastern Europeans who always have, have some problems. Actually, we have legitimate problems and we absolutely have a right to complain. But what maybe help a lot is to be more vocal also on the constructive ideas that we bring on the table. And we do bring them on the table. It just, we need to make sure that this is the highlight and this is where the attention is focused. Roman and Tomasz, uh, would you like to react on the question of identity and the V4 brand? <laughs> well, perception of, of V4 brand. 
Um, I think that many issues concerning the rule of law or democratic rule of law or freedom of media uh, for which Poland and Hungary are being criticized by the European Parliament, European Commission, are differences of political opinion. So opposition, with, uh, opposition in Poland and Hungary agrees with the majority position in Western Europe. We in the Czech Republic uh, perceive that as a matter of internal political division. And we don't want to take sides. We are completely neutral. But we definitely do not want either Poland or Hungary, being by Central European Union institutions humiliated. Because if that happens to Poland and or Hungary, it could one day happen to us, to the Czech Republic and to Slovakia. So for a reason of geopolitical closeness of Poland and Hungary, and for the reason of the need for good relations of all V4 countries, we will never join, never. In, up, in the current political situation in the Czech Republic, we will not uh, join any, any tough measures against either Poland and Hungary, because it's primarily internal political issue. This is the first point. Concerning brand, uh, we now have a conservative prime minister in the Czech Republic, uh, as conservative as it is possible in secular and liberal Czech society. Uh, we, you cannot expect anything more conservative than is our incumbent prime minister uh, and his party. Uh, for us, or for that current of political opinion, Poland is a regional power, regional power in Central Eastern Europe, and uh, the main guarantor of trying actively to stop Russian drang na Westen. So for us, Poland plays major role. And now, after the Russian aggression against Ukraine, that's visible for all. So whatever Pol Poland did, or Polish government did, was less dangerous or less important for us than, for example, German energy vendor. That we consider as a big mistake. Uh, the German decision to close down both coal, uh, electric facilities, and the nuclear power plants. Uh, for us, that was no rational decision. And now, when the prices of energy are high and might be even higher, I think that both Germany and, and the whole European Union need something like a reconsideration of the Green New European deal. Either postponement, phasing out of our attempt to, to leave carbon-based sources of energy, or uh, to be much more favorable towards uh, nuclear power plants, nuclear energy. That's really important. Uh, if you add that uh, German government, both the former one, Merkel government, and now Scholz government, uh, their attempt to continue with Nord Stream 2 till the Russian aggression started, we consider that problematic for us, for certainly Europe. Something like giving Russia another leverage uh, over us and over Central Europe. So if the brand of V4 in some Western European countries uh, was, let us say, a damaged good, uh, so many people here considered German political position choices and decisions uh, to be problematic for the security of the whole of Europe, not only of our region, but of the whole of Europe. Uh, the war is a great clarifier, so now, Everybody sees uh, that uh, Polish were not uh, historically Russo Russophobic, that Polish were rational concerning Russia, were more prudent uh, than those who considered Russia to be much more benign power than it really is. And uh, I, I am hopeful that now in the European Union, when everybody condemns uh, in no uncertain terms Russian aggression, that there will be some profound and needed re-evaluation of our common European policies. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, concerning the identity question, uh, I think that, first of all, we have uh, so many common interests. Of course, we have also 
differences and uh, uh, variety of perspectives on, on uh, money issues. But uh, basically, we have uh, we share the same uh, geography, uh, we share the same uh, history. We have uh, many uh, uh, common uh, interests and could improve our position uh, by our co cooperation inside the EU and uh, in external relations. So, um, uh, I I in that re uh, respect, uh, my opinion is that we should follow uh, our cooperation uh, because it is of our uh, reason the trail, we would say, or uh, common uh, interests. Uh, and uh, regional identity is uh, useful. To, uh, to the creation of regional identity is highly important to uh, develop friendship relations, uh, to, to develop a tolerant perspective, because we also have some differences, it's obvious. But if we tolerate our differences, it is, uh, in my view, highly important to uh, establish prosperous future. Uh, of, uh, it is, it is some hand, might be a handicap for for future cooperation, uh, co future cooperation, and we should learn on the EU mistakes. Uh, the Western European countries are not so tolerant. Uh, for our uh, uh, difference, cu cultural, political differences. The migration crisis is one example. The so-called uh, uh, struggle on uh, European values is the, another one. Uh, the, the difference between uh, more left-wing and uh, uh, more right-wing or conservative approach towards values, political values. In democratic systems, uh, both of them should be respected, should be tolerated, particularly uh, in international organizations like the EU. And it is, it is for me quite curious why Western Europe is uh, so intolerant and undemocratic in that way, because they try to impose own perception of left-wing and liberal values on uh, Central European countries, part of them. And in my view, it is not democratic. And it is highly disturbing for the future of Europe. It's a it's strategic mistake. Uh, Roman uh, mentioned uh, many German mistakes related to energy policy, to, to uh, co close cooperation with Russia on uh, energy issues uh, like uh, development of, of Nord Stream pipelines, etc. It was strategic fault, strategic mistake which resulted uh, uh, with uh, weakening the, the, the whole Europe. It, 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 it hit us in Central Europe, hit Germany and uh, other Western countries. So it was to the detri clear detriment it, uh, to, uh, to the EU. And another strategic mistake is the, the fighting on European values. For me, it is absolutely clear. clear. So. Uh, taking these mistakes into consideration for our regional cooperation, we should be more tolerant, res respectful uh, to our differences, looking rather on common goods, common interests, which could uh, make us together, because we have huge common challenges still. The EU should also focus on common goods, uh, the strategic challenges, not looking for divisions, looking for um, the, the, the topics which could uh, raise emotions, political emotions, and touch highly sensitive issues. I would like to remind you that uh, 
the, the, the problem uh, uh, related to abortion or, or uh, minority rights, it is defined by so-called European values, but it is not um, established in the treaty. It is domestic competences of member states to resolve uh, those uh, issues uh, in accordance to, 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 to uh, democratic procedures uh, in given member state. So it is the powers of member states, not of the EU. So it is clear breach of treaty. It is, it is clear breach of rule of law by European institutions and some Western countries, or at least part of politicians in the West. But, uh, in West. but uh, of course it is a more important issue because it is highly challenging for domestic democracy. Uh, we have no clear or well-established democracy on the EU level. We have so-called democratic deficit. So the foundation of democratic procedures in Europe is um, member, member state democracy. So we should respect member state democracy as a, as a very important uh, 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 issue for, for, for democratic standard in Europe. It is my opinion. But uh, maybe, uh, uh, so my conclusion, my, my basic point is that we have to learn on uh, the EU, EU's mistakes to be more tolerant, respectful, and um, also respectful for our de uh, national democracies among Visegrad group. It is very important for our uh, future. So I could have a thousand follow-up questions to you, but we are running out of time, so I turn to the audience. Um, please raise your hands and introduce yourself. Anton. <laughs> yeah, we need to use the mic because uh, it will be in the video. Um, so my question um, in regard to your uh, countries, to um, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic and Poland, what are the uh, existing dominating narratives regarding the, the Visegrad group because we see many things we are here in Budapest in Hungary we see many things from our Hungarian perspective but what are the dominating um, expectations or visions for the Visegrad group inside your your own country could you comment on that please okay uh, let's collect a few more questions My name is Janos Hovari, the former ambassador to Turkey. When I was ambassador to Turkey in the year 2012 and 2014, I remember the great struggle for the Nabucco. I think it is necessary to talk about the fate of the Nabucco. That, uh, so, well, it is obvious that uh, uh, the German energy policy and the other energy policies in Central Europe are trapped. Uh, that's, uh, we are more dependent than the Russian gas and it would be necessary. But we should talk about the reason. The Nabucco failed and the Nabucco could provide the proper quantity of gas with the good prices for whole Central Europe, Hungary, Austria, uh, Slovakia, and even for Germany. And I, I didn't, um, that, that's, that's an ambassador, I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand what was going on. Originally it was planned, or that's, that's to have a connection with the Caspian Sea and the Central Europe, and, and finally it was diverted towards the Southern Mediterranean. I think it was a great strategic mistake. And it was a conspiracy of a business conspiracy. Most of the British petroleum, who made a certain deals in Russia, as far as I knew, and was gossiped in Ankara. But we, that, that the main problem, so that, that if we're talking about the responsibility of, of these changes in the energy policy, we should talk about Nabucco. Uh, that's, uh, it, it, it is my comment. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see if there is one more comment or question. If none, then uh, 
I don't know who would like to start. We had one question on the dominating V4 narratives in your respective countries and the remark about uh, Nabucco. Uh, so who would like to start? I can start. I don't know much about Nabucco, so I'll probably skip it if possible. Uh, going back to Anton's question, uh, in Slovakia, uh, V4 is seen as a very good practical tool how to improve relations with the neighbors, how to cooperate with the neighbors, so Slovakia wants to stick with it. Uh, the, in general, Slovaks love neighbors. We understand that uh, um, it's good to have important neighborhood relations, and uh, in many ways our fates are combined together, so we do want regional projects and to make sure that there's smooth uh, cooperation between the countries. But it's also uh, increasingly understanding that uh, Slovak interests are not necessarily the interests of the neighbors and vice versa, so there is this desire to avoid uh, having before being used to channel somebody's and else's interests without having explicit consent of Slovakia. But in general, it's a rather positive image uh, and people would like V4 to continue on the practical matters. In the society as a whole, among uh, journalists, politicians, there is the whole spectrum of political opinions on, on V4. There are some who claim that uh, Czech Republic should be more like Germany and Western Europe and less like Poland and Hungary and Slovakia. Uh, there are others who completely disagree and consider special relationship inside V4 countries as a good for our security and our future because we must have good relations with neighboring countries. And for historical purposes, Hungary is perceived as a neighboring country. Uh, so there is the broad spectrum of opinions. Uh, however, when you look at the policies of our prime ministers, the last one and this one, on policies of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, always the opinion prevails that uh, we shouldn't rock the boat, that Visegrad 4 is worth preserving. And I uh, think that that will continue to be the majority opinion. Concerning Nabucco, Mr. Ambassador, I agree with you that it was that was a shame, that was a big mistake, that it was not completed as originally intended. I was told that the British Petroleum was responsible. I don't know for sure who was responsible, but for us, that was a mistake. Tomasz. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the first question uh, uh, related to the opinion of, uh, about uh, V4 cooperation in Poland, uh, in Polish society, or maybe it, it, it would be better to describe the um, uh, position on the V4 cooperation among uh, uh, Polish uh, uh, political elites uh, as well as in the media or uh, among uh, uh, think tanks or civil society, we would say. Uh, we have division of opinion in general. Um, uh, the, the one is positive. Uh, the second one is rather maybe not negative, uh, but uh, uh, critique to uh, deepening this, uh, this uh, cooperation too much. Uh, to, to, so, uh, uh, but. As you know, a po Polish political elite is highly divided. We have strong opposition, uh, which is uh, critical to uh, current uh, conservative uh, government. And the same situation is Polish uh, media landscape. So we have uh, mm, basically foreign German or American uh, media outlets which support strongly opposition, and they are uh, also uh, highly critic to governmental po uh, inter foreign policy. So uh, the, the government position towards uh, Visegrad group is, in general, highly positive. They want to strengthen uh, uh, regional cooperation both in terms of Visegrad group as well as uh, 3C's initiative. 
But the regional cooperation in Central Europe is highly important in uh, for current uh, uh, government um, foreign policy. So opposition and opposition uh, media are highly critic towards uh, each governmental policy, including uh, approach uh, to uh, deepening cooperation in Central Europe. And uh, they don't uh, want to stop this cooperation, of course. They uh, want to uh, rather uh, close, uh, or, or make some, some more friendly policy uh, to, German, uh, to, to Germany. So to cooperate with uh, Germany in terms of uh, money, uh, public issues or, or topics. And uh, because they feel that Germans are not so optimistic vis-a-vis uh, -vis Visegrad cooperation or deepening the regional cooperation in Central Europe, they don't want to disturb uh, relations with Germans by promoting uh, uh, regional cooperation in Central Europe. So, so they, uh, this is uh, our uh, opposition position, we would say. And uh, uh, but still, uh, opposition politicians want uh, Visegrad Group as a uh, limited cooperation related to some administrative data, not to huge fight for uh, Central European independence, or uh, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Western part of the EU. So don't, uh, they don't want to follow um, broader geopolitical vision of Central Europe as a, as a strong. Uh, autonomous player inside the EU or in external relations. But, uh, but uh, as I said, they support limited cooperation related to some details, and, and uh, particularly among uh, our countries, so we could resolve uh, problems uh, neighboring, uh, between neighboring countries, but not maybe uh, making some stronger, uh, stronger uh, ambition to um, creating common position on uh, in the EU or some some uh, in some other directions. Okay, let's see if there is one last question in the audience. Maybe then, if not, then maybe I have a last question to you, uh, Tomasz connection with, with the same question of uh, the dominating view for narratives in your countries. So do you think that the war changed the perspective of the Polish political elites towards, uh, towards the V4 cooperation? It is a difficult question uh, because we have so many emotions recently. Uh, for uh, I can see some uh, improvement of our cooperation, for instance, between Pol uh, Poles and Czech uh, in, in our common position, but also Slovak. Uh, we have the same approach to Russia, to Ukraine uh, war, to um, this, uh, all of these uh, things, but. Uh, in Polish media uh, uh, was related some some quarrels or, or some emotional discussion related to ha Hungarian position, uh, which is uh, more neutral in comparison to us, to, to, to other uh, V4 uh, member states. But still we had also uh, some, some uh, comments uh, uh, from governmental officials which uh, tried to calm down the emotions and uh, uh, try to convince the public that our strategic interests, particularly with Hungary, 
uh, are common, the same, and uh, we should uh, not to focus on, on uh, current emotions, but rather to perceive the common interests, uh, which are strategical. Okay, the same question goes to Alena and, and Roman as well, to your respective uh, countries, uh, but just very quickly in a few sentences. Uh, definitely, especially given that the countries are on the front line, literally, and they're board burning. So in many ways, cooperation indeed improved, even with Hungary on practical issues concerning the flow of people and so on. Uh, and definitely, of course, because Poland plays such an important role in all the logistical matters, not just military logistics, but also humanitarian aid logistics, there has been intense cooperation on these matters. Uh, definitely on the matter of specifically Hungarian, position, it's an outlier from the V4, and that's what makes the cooperation uh, difficult. That's why also there is more of an attempt, let's focus on the practical issues. Uh, this is not something we share in terms of the way how Hungarians are framing its position, uh, at least how it's perceived uh, publicly. But uh, let's work on the practical issues that are still there and in the end need to be resolved. Well, since February 24th, uh, everybody is living with events on the Ukraine, and now the priority is to help Ukraine for, for Czech political, uh, I would say the whole political class. So there, there are very minor differences between coalition government and opposition part especially the main party of former prime minister concerning concerning the Czech response to the Russian aggression against Ukraine. There is a consensus that we must help Ukrainians to defeat Russian aggression. And that's now short-term priority. I don't think that that priority will have any impact on V4 cooperation. The V4 cooperation will, will continue. Uh, but for now, few people are thinking about V4. Uh, more people are thinking about what else to do for Ukraine. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roman, Tomás, and Alana, uh, for being here and sharing your opinions with us. And thank you again for the questions coming from the audience. I think that this last topic will be continued in the next panel. So uh, I hope that you are already excited. So now we are having um, a coffee break, a short coffee break. Uh, thank you very much for being here. <laughs>